from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Earl Foreman, Johnny. Earl, I just left you down in Florida. Where are you? Right where you left me, right here in Sarasota. Oh, well, if you're worried about my expense account for that case we cleaned up together, I was just about to mail it to you. Why don't you bring it down here instead? Huh? A couple of hours after you hopped aboard your plane back to Hartford, I got a phone call from Bill Hall. Remember him? Fellow who runs that men's shop on the Tamiami Trail? That's right, Webb. Bill owns the place. Sure, I bought a sport jacket and a couple of pairs of slacks there at Webb's. Well, somebody cleaned him out of about $10,000 worth of merchandise last night. Oh, and you'd insured it for him? Yes, I'd also issued a $10,000 policy on the man he had there as a night watchman. Earl. Yeah, Johnny. The police think he was murdered. Okay, I'll grab the first plane I can. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-State Life and Casualty Company, Sarasota office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the net of circumstance matter. Expense account item one, $75, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Tampa, Florida. There I figured on changing planes, but Earl Poorman met me in his car, and by 7 p.m. we arrived in Sarasota. We drove straight to Webb's. The place was in a mess. Well, I'll say this, Mr. Pullman. You certainly didn't waste any time. Well, I didn't see any reason to, Bill. Johnny, you remember Bill Hall. Yeah, sure. How are you, Bill? Not good, Dollar. Not good. Look at the place. Yeah, I see. You've lost a lot of your stock. We haven't finished checking yet. I sent the boys on to get some sleep, but as nearly as we can tell, whoever did this got away with over 9,000 worth of clothing and accessories. And heaven knows what they did to old Jimson. Jimson? Jimson Cooley, the night watchman. Sir, you said over the phone that you thought he's been murdered. Yes, sir. Somehow, they must have got old Jimson to open the back door for them. Then, when he saw what they were up to, he tried to fight them off. You'll see the marks of a big struggle out back. And bits of his clothing were lying around, covered with blood. But no sign of him. Johnny, the police figure that they must have killed him and then dumped his body somewhere. You keep saying they, Bill. Well, they had so little time that well, one man couldn't have done it alone very well. You see, it all happened between the regular rounds of the PD's prowl car. Last time this sort of thing happened, there were three men in on it. Were you been robbed before? About a year ago, something like 18,000 worth. The police managed to track down two of them. Oh, what about the third? Well, he was never identified, or rather he was identified but never located. Anyhow, it was after that that we put old Jimson on his night watchman. Hmm. I wonder about that third man. Was your store the only place that Jimson watched? Yeah, after all, he was a pretty old man. I, I gave him the job to help him out as much as anything else. And I figured his just being around would keep something like this from happening again. I guess I was wrong. Jimson used to run a shrimp boat in his spare time. He used to work the spot east of Humpback Bridge a lot, south of City Island. That's right. Come to think of it, I heard a boat working out there last night. The point is, he couldn't really make a living at it, so he was glad to take what little we could give him for this watchman's job. And in return, somebody's taken his life. You afraid so? Of course, you can't be sure until his body's found. What are you thinking of, Johnny? Well, if by any chance this Jimson Cooley isn't dead... The police say that according to all the evidence... If he's still alive, he's the one person who could tell us something about whoever cleaned out this shop. Have the police found any actual clues to work on? Well, no. That's where you're wrong, sir. Uh, Sergeant Drummond. That's right. Johnny boy, how are you? Hiya, Sergeant. So they dragged you in on this. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Well, you know how it is, Drummond. When the police can't get anywhere, you call in the expert. Oh, and I thought you were a friend of mine, Mr. Pullman. You said that Bill was wrong, Sergeant. What, sir? When he told me your boys haven't found any clues to who did this job and knocked off Jimson Cooley. Knocked him off, huh? Well, now, what's that mean? One of the boys picked up a drunk last night right in this neighborhood. Yeah? Late this morning, when he'd sobered up enough, we sent him home. But a little while ago, he comes barging back to headquarters. Seems he'd suddenly remembered something he saw around here last night. Come on, Sergeant. Oh, well, must have been around 2 or 3 a.m. That's when we figured the robbery occurred. And the murder of Jimson Cooley. Yeah. Please, get to the point, Drummond. 
Well, he was holding up that building across the street, minding his own business and his bottle, when all of a sudden he saw a car come round from in back of this building and head north on the trail. Maybe two of them, he wasn't sure. Anyhow, the one he noticed was a little pickup truck. But in his condition, I suppose he didn't get a license number. Didn't need to, Johnny, because he recognized that truck. Oh? Yes, sir. And he said it was all loaded down with something, with an old piece of canvas stretched over it. The stuff that was stolen from me. Maybe. You say he recognized that pickup? Whose was it? Yeah. Johnny, it was that old 1930 model he used the whole shrimp in. What? Whose? That's you right. Mean... That's right. It was that old truck that Jim Smoothie. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now for another episode in the life of Sergeant Donald Bellwether, my husband. <laughs> Good morning, Mrs. Bellwether. Would my lady prefer to have her breakfast in bed this morning? Oh, what a perfect husband. Thank you, darling. Ah, here's the tray with the coffee, the toast, and the orange. Oh, fine. I forgot the orange juice. Uh, hold the tray, honey. I'll be right back. Oh, 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 oh darling, what happened? Oh, oh, I stuck my toe in the corner of the dresser. Uh, oh, the National Safety Council oh. was right. The, the what? Last night, I read something in a National Safety Council pamphlet. Oh, Reba, and... how can you sit there talking about a pamphlet when I'm dying of slow torture with death? Oh, come over here, darling. I'm sorry. All right. Now, what's this about the National Safety Council? Did they predict I would stub my toe this morning? <laughs> no, silly. It's just a coincidence. Only last night, I read the statistics that proved that more home accidents occur in the bedroom of all places. Yeah. Not the bathroom or the kitchen or the home workshop. The bedroom. Yeah. Okay, so from now on, when I walk around the bedroom, I'm going to wear my combat boots instead of these open-toed hirachis. Well, that might help, dear. But what everyone should be most careful of is taking medicine in the dark. Okay, my living safety encyclopedia. I will now fetch your orange. Here. Oh, you're sweet. And it's just too bad that you nice men are so prone to accidents in the home. And the reason is because you brave men usually tackle the hazardous jobs around the house. Hey, I'll uh, remember those kind words as I slowly limp back to the kitchen. One thing in your favor, though, Sarge. Married men stand a better chance of avoiding fatal accidents in the home. Now, is that a fact? Mm-hmm. You know, in one state, 75% of the men involved in home mishaps were unmarried. Well, I'm sure glad I'm married. Because the accident odds are better? You know, because I like my wife. Even when she first wakes up in the morning. Mm, that's my Donald. That's my doll. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Net of Circumstance Matter. Yeah, everything indicated that whoever burglarized Webb's haberdashery there in Sarasota had murdered the night watchman, old Jimson Coley. That is, until somebody reported having seen a loaded pickup truck at the time of the robbery pull away from the back of the store. And whose truck was it? Yes, sir, he swears it was that old 1930 pickup of Jimson Cooley's. And he says it went north on the Tamiami Trail. Yes, sir. Well, what have you done about it, Sergeant? Alerted every police department from here to the Georgia state line to be on the lookout for him. Didn't you know that truck was missing from wherever Jimson lived? Well, we hadn't actually got around to checking on his place yet. You thought he was murdered, and you didn't even bother to check his home? Well, we called his wife, Johnny, and when she said he hadn't come home with all the evidence of a big fight out back of this store... Oh, fine. You can't blame him, Johnny. All the blood back there, bits of Jimson's clothing that were torn off on... Look, look, maybe it's just a wild hunch, but... Earl... Yes, Johnny. You suppose Doc Crutcher's at home? Probably. He lives just up the street from my house. Oh, we got a doctor connected with headquarters, you know, Johnny. Well, how do we get out the back way? Why, well, right out here, Johnny. What's this hunch you've got? Uh, tell you, Earl, and it'd probably turn out to be wrong. Yeah. Now, you can see for yourself, Dollar, why we figured him a dead one. Old Jimson, I mean. Yeah. There's busted railing, blood spattered around, and look there, where somebody hit the dirt. Pool of blood there, too. You must have lost plenty. And also, we picked up a short length of lead pipe with blood on it. Is this a piece of cloth from the shirt he was wearing? Yeah, Johnny, it's from a shirt I gave him. Torn off in the fight. Uh, well, I guess we must overlook that little piece. Yeah. Maybe that isn't all. Mind if I keep it? Oh, sure. Go ahead. 
Well, what do you mean? Come on, Earl. If you feel like driving me around a bit, there are a couple of people I'd like to see. Sure. No, no, wait a minute. We'll see you later. Yeah, it was a hunch. Nothing else. But I learned a long time ago that sometimes it pays to play a hunch for all it's worth. Particularly when you haven't anything real solid to work on. Ignoring Earl's questions, I had him drive me to Doc Crutcher's home out on St. Armand's Key. Fortunately, he was at home. Even better, we found him in his study, poring over a microscope. Oh, sure, Johnny. I'd be glad to, just as soon as I finish making this hemoglobin count. Well, there's no hurry, Doc. I'll drop by and check with you later. Jimson Cooley, huh? We, uh, uh, we'll see. Look, Johnny, do you mind telling me what this is all about? Not until I'm sure myself, Earl. Listen, do you think you can find out where old Jimson's wife lives? Well, sure, I guess Don't I Don't you mean widow, Johnny? Maybe. Well, last I heard... Everything I've heard, well, it doesn't all tie up. But, Johnny, if Jimson's still alive... That's what I'm banking on. Come on, Earl. The Cooley place far out on the edge of town was a shack and nothing more. In the darkness, it didn't look much better than the beat-up chicken house at the back of it. As for the chickens, well, half of them were asleep out in the yard until we got there. Yes, I'm coming, I'm coming. Yes, what... Oh, Mr. Palmer. Mrs. Cooley, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Listen in now, Mr. Palmer. They found Jimson's body yet? Well, no. As a matter of fact... Well, I sure hope they do. That's all I got to say. Because if they don't, at least what Miss Canterwell told me today, if they don't, I might have to wait five, six years before I can collect that insurance that Webb bought on him. Yeah. Well, got any news about him or not? Johnny, you, uh, you don't seem to care much whether your husband's alive or not, Mrs. Cooley. No, why should I? You lazy bum. It wasn't for me raising these hips. Ah, this guy! When he was shrimping and selling them for bait to them Yankees that come down to fish around the other winter, he done pretty good. We had meat on the table now and then, besides chicken. But ever since they got in that soft job sitting around that store every night. Did you notify the police when he failed to come home this morning? I did not. Besides, when I seen that one of them nets was missing. You see where he keeps them hung over the limb of that tree out there? Mrs. Cooley. Well, what I figured is maybe he'd gone out to do some more shrimping. Or else he'd taken it out and sold it so as he could buy some more of that rot gut he's been drinking lately. So I got this broom handy by the door. What do you mean? To keep him out so as he wouldn't try to come in and beat me. Beat you? Sure, like he always does when he's been drinking. And then when he didn't come home at all... Mrs. And Cooley. When Miss Canterwell stopped by and told me he'd been killed... Well, you know who I think, Donnie? Who? One of that gang that tried to rob Webb last year. Now, why do you think that? Because Jimson told me one of them was around town. That's why. Jimson knew who he was and didn't report it to the police? Well, how should I know? Hmm. I wonder why not. Now, look, if you all didn't come around to pay me my insurance, what is it you want? Well, what I really stopped by for, Mrs. Cooley, was to see if you'd sell me one of your chickens. Why? Yeah. Why, sure. Only it'll cost you money. Uh, maybe 75 cents? All right. Here. Here's a dollar, and we'll call it even. Well, thank you. Here, chick, 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 chick. Here, you look out for them fancy clothes of yours, and I'll wring its neck. Here you are. Only I suppose you want it plucked, too. No, no, thanks. Suppose you just give me the head. Eh? Yeah, you can have the rest of it for dinner tomorrow. What? And come on, Earl. Let's get back to St. Armand's Key. I'm sorry, Johnny, but I really ought to have some of the materials down at my office for putting that specimen you gave me under the microscope. Of course, if you could wait until morning... Oh, sure, why not? Once more, I could use a little shut-eye. But here. Yeah. Hmm? Take along a sample of the blood from this, too, would you? You've been out raiding somebody's chicken coop? Well, you may want it for comparison, if you know what I mean. Uh, Yes, Johnny, I think I do. Well, I don't. Earl... Why don't you and I go home and get some sleep? Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Do you know who said, that man is free who is protected from injury? Those words came from Daniel Webster, one of the most eloquent orators in American history. Webster knew that a man could not be free unless he lived in a country which recognized his right to freedom and created laws to protect that freedom. 
A slave state may say that its citizens are free, but as long as a single citizen can be harmed by the whim of a country's rulers, true freedom does not exist. A man is free only if his rights to freedom are protected. Remember the words of Daniel Webster. They are part of your American heritage. The free man must be protected from injury. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Early the next morning, I get a phone call from Sergeant Drummond down at headquarters. Yes, sir, Johnny. Some of the boys found him laying in his car on a little wagon trail just off B Ridge Road. Jimson Cooley? Jimson Cooley. Must have been laying there unconscious ever since a burglar slugged him and took him out there. But he's a rugged old cuss, so he's in pretty good shape now. What did he say about that burglary, Sergeant? Same as we figured. Man made him open the back door, beat him up, cleaned out the place, and probably thought he'd killed him. So he drove him out to that side road and left him there. What about the stuff that was stolen? Must have transferred it to his own car when he left Jimson there. Was Jimson able to identify him? Said he claimed to be the man we never did get for robbing that store the first time. You want to talk to Jimson? Yes, Sergeant. I'll be right over. I had Earl drive me down to headquarters. I saw Jimson Cooley, talked to him, but learned nothing from him I didn't already know. He was a disagreeable old coot, the sort who would get drunk and beat his wife. He still wore his badly torn clothes, and yes, he had a couple of cuts and bad bruises. But were they enough to account for all the blood we'd found in back of the store? I asked Earl to drive me over to Doc Crutch's office. Well, just finished, Johnny. And? I'm sorry, but the blood that was spilled out in back of that store was not chicken blood. But... Well, now I see what you were driving at, Johnny. You figured maybe Jensen had done the robbery himself. Wait, Earl. Then he'd covered the place with chicken blood to back up that story of a fight with some burglar. Oh, I think he was in a fight, all right. Huh? But I don't think he lost. Doc? As I started to say, I wanted to check the blood on that piece of his shirt you brought me here in the office where I have a record of Jimson's blood type. I got it when I made his insurance examination. Or was it his on the shirt? It was human blood, all right, but not Jimson Cooley's. All right, then I guess his story of having been forced to open the store, then beat up and knocked out and left out there in his car by the burglar is true. Wrong, Earl. Well, what do you mean? Why not? Didn't you say you heard a shrimp boat out on the bay last night? Well, sure, but what's that got Cooley's to Cooley's wife said one of those heavy-weighted shrimp nets was missing, didn't she? Well, yes, I... And remember that. this. Bill Hall said that one man wouldn't have had time to take all that stuff out of his store alone. So maybe there were two burglars, and I still don't Jimson see... Jimson said there was only one, so I think he was helping him. And Earl, do you think for a minute that Jimson lost all the blood we saw out in back of that store? You saw him there at headquarters. Well, he didn't exactly look as though he could didn't. He? But then, Johnny... First, we wanted to find Jimson's body, but then he turned up alive. Now we'd better find the body of this other man, whoever he is. Uh, you're right, Johnny. Then you'll really have a case. Sure. So, well, let's go fishing. Fishing? Well, you know how it is. When I'm really stuck in a case, everything all muddled up, well, it's time to relax and kind of let your head clear. Come on, let's go. Sure, Earl thought I was crazy. But we unhitched the boat from his private dock and headed up the bayou. Then passed under Humpback Bridge and into the outer end of Sarasota Bay. Out toward City Island, where WSPB has its radio tower. I tied on a heavy trolling rig and tossed the line overboard. Johnny, you're crazy to use that heavy rig out here. The water's real shallow. All it'll do is drag the bottom. A little slower, Earl. Here in the bay, we use live shrimp to get sea trout. You know, about a number two hook and no sinker, we bottom fish. Slower, will you? Okay, whatever you say. And so we trolled back and forth over the place where Jimson ran his shrimp line. Johnny, it's no good fishing here with that heavy tackle. If this is where he got his shrimp, there ought to be fish or something. Maybe I'm after that something. I think you've gone nuts. 10, 15, maybe 20 times I had to reel in the line and take off a clump of seaweed that had gotten tangled in it. We all began to get impatient. If we were really going to fish, why didn't we do it right? Then suddenly the old fluger started to sing. Hold it, Earl. Kill the engine. Yeah, what is it? Just hold your horses. 
What under the sun have you tied into, Johnny? If this line will hold, we may have what I've been looking for. I can't imagine what kind of a fish would be that big here in the bay. It... Oh, fine, fine. All you've done is get snagged up in some old hunk of rotten fish net. Yeah, or a shrimp net. If you'll just help me get it aboard. Sure. Just a little more, Johnny, and I'll be able to reach the part where you've hooked into it. A little more. A little... Yeah, I got it. Now, give me a hand. All right. Here, yeah, now. Oh, they put a lot of lead on these nets. But I never thought they could be this. John, look what's in it. Yeah. Good Lord. When Jimson was faced with the man's body wrapped in the net he'd sunk out there in the bay, he broke down and told us what had really happened. He even told us where the stolen stuff was hidden. Yeah, the dead man was one of the gang who'd robbed the store a year ago. He persuaded Jimson to help him, do it again, offered him a hundred bucks. But then when he had the stuff, he tried to run out without paying off. So, Jimson had killed him. Now the courts will have to take over. Incidentally, I understand that Webbs is installing a foolproof burglar alarm system. Expense account total $151.50. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Starring Bob Bailey originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Lillian Bias, Vic Perlin, Harry Bartell, Barney Phillips, Bartlett Robinson, and Bill James. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. <laughs>